Welcome back guys to another lesson within Unit 7 of the IGCSE Computer Science Syllabus. We are still looking at algorithm design and problem solving, in particular pseudocode. And the pseudocode that we will look at today is what we call methods of solution, which is all about the standard methods that can be used within pseudocode, including these methods listed here. So we are going to look at the standard method of totaling, counting, finding the maximum, minimum and average value. And in the next lesson, we will look at these two standard algorithms as these are quite complex and will need a bit more time. So today we are just going to focus on one, two and three. And we're going to use our previous knowledge of assigning variables, using conditional statements and even using iteration. We're going to tie it all together in order to complete these standard methods of solution. And again, give us an extra level of knowledge when it comes to programming and in particular problem solving and algorithm design. So first of all, a standard method of solution is a set of instructions that already exist and are very common across the world of computer science. Being able to use these methods across different scenarios is a key, especially when designing algorithms. Being able to repeat these methods whenever we need to use them is the skill that we need to develop. When we create an algorithm using pseudocode and we turn it into a program, some of them may be used thousands of times, which means we don't need to rewrite them. So these methods listed here have been around for many years and by you understanding when and where to use them will again make you a better programmer and especially a better problem solver. So I've mentioned there, you don't have to reinvent the wheel because like I said, some of these methods have been around for many years. They are proven methods and we just need to learn how and when to use them. So the first one is what we call totaling. So being able to keep a total value, okay? It's maintaining a sum where new values are continuously added. So we're keeping a total of numbers by constantly adding it and storing that value in some kind of variable. An example that we're going to do is keep a running total of the scores given to each student in a class. So as we move forward, we will use this scenario in order to apply our standard methods and gain a better understanding. But the first one, to keep a total, this example here, we set a variable called total to equal zero. So the variable total contains the number zero. Then we've got a for loop. And the reason why we've used a for loop is because we know how many numbers that we want to enter. This example here just takes in 10 numbers. So the counter variable here starts at one and will loop until it reaches 10. So it's going to loop 10 times. And again, we use a for loop, in other words, a count control loop, when we know how many times we want it to loop. So this will loop 10 times, and each time it loops, we enter a number, we store that number in the variable called number, and then our original variable of total, which is currently zero, we add number to it and store it, overwriting the original total. So if we input the number 15, for example, 15 plus zero equals 15, and 15 is saved inside this variable. If we didn't do this part here, we wouldn't keep a running total of the numbers being put in. So this is a crucial step when it comes to totaling a value, not just adding the numbers together, but by storing it in the variable that we've assigned for the total. Each time this algorithm loops around, we enter a new number and keep adding it to the total. Again, it will stop once counter reaches 10, and we will have input 10 numbers and kept a total value along the way. Okay, so it is important that we understand what a for loop is. So if you do need to go back and watch that video, by all means do so. This is our first standard method of keeping a total in an algorithm. The next standard method is counting. And although very similar to totaling, which we've just looked at, there are a few key differences that we need to highlight, which in this case, we are counting how many times something happens, or in other words, an action occurs. So we are literally counting up by one. So in this example, what I've done is I've combined a conditional statement to check if a student received a passing grade. Okay, so the passing grade is set to 50%. Okay, so the conditional statement is gonna check the grades over 50%. Now, first things first, I create a variable called pass count, and this is going to store the amount of grades that have passed. In other words, this is our counter. Okay, so count is short for counter. Again, I know how big the class is, so I'm going to use a for loop because I've got 30 values that I'm going to input. So input student mark is our input command and student mark is going to be the variable where that mark is stored. I then check if the student mark is more than or equal to 50. And if it is, pass count, which I created here, I simply add one to it and then store the result. So unlike a total, if I just flick back, the total adds the number that we've input. Here, we add one. So that's the biggest difference between totaling and counting. 
Once the algorithm finishes, the pass count will have the final result, which will equal the amount of passing grades that were input into the algorithm. The next method of solution is simply finding the average. Okay, so this goes back to the totaling algorithm, because once we've got a total, all we need to do is divide it by the number of values that have been input. Now, in this case, this is when we know how many values that exist. We've been using a for loop from one to 30, so we know there's gonna be 30 values input. I've created a total and stored the result of the input marks in this total, so at the end of the algorithm, it's gonna store all of the results added together. I then simply divide it by 30, because I know there are 30 students, and I store this answer in an average variable. And then what I can do, if I wanted to, I could output the average mark is, and then print out the average variable. But averaging, really simple, especially when you know how many values have been input or that are stored in the program. If we don't know how many values there are to find out the average, so for example, here we've got an array. I've introduced an array in this example because we might not know how many student marks are actually stored in this array. So what we need to do in this scenario is use the previous standard method of solution, which was to keep a count. So now we've got two variables. We've got total and the count. Now, if you can think ahead, obviously, once we've got the total, all we need to do is divide it by the count. And in order to keep a count, we just add one every time we go around our loop, which will run for the length of the array. So this word here, length in capital letters, is going to run for the amount of values that student mark has in it. So at the top here, I'm just going to draw an example of what student marks may look like. So the student marks array may only have 10 values. And if we think back to our arrays, index starts at one, two, three, all the way up to 10. Now in this array, I've got 10 student marks and these could be any numbers that I've input previously. So I'm just gonna make these up as we go along. And we've got some sample data that we can now test our algorithm with. So starting from the top, we create a variable called total and assign the value zero to it. We do the same with the variable count. So we've got two variables to store some data inside. Next, we have a for loop, and we should now be familiar with what happens with a for loop, that i is our iterator. It's simply a variable to keep a track of which loop that we're on, and it's going to run to the length of student marks. So in this case, student marks has 10 values in it, so 10 pieces of data inside, which essentially means that this is going to run from one to 10. Okay, so this 10 could change depending on how big the array is, but the function length simply tells the program how long it should run for. Then once we're in the loop, following the previous example, we simply just keep a total of the student marks using the i as our location for each value. So the first time this loop runs, i is set to one. Okay, we've already explained this. So i is set to one, meaning that we are currently up here. Okay, so the one here is where we are currently at. The value from this position is added to the total and it's stored in the total variable. So it takes the 45 from this position and it stores it in the total. So total now equals 45. Count goes up by one, so count is now one. And then next i means that i goes up by one and i will now be two. So our iterator here will now equal two. So now that the iterator is two, our arrow here moves over to this position and it's pointing to the next location in the array. So it loops around and it comes back to here. It then adds the student mark i, which i is now two, which is 55, not this one, it's 55. And it adds that to the current total, which is currently 45 and stores that value. So 55 plus 45 equals 100. The total is now 100. Count equals count plus one, so count is now two. And as you can imagine, this will keep looping around until i equals 10, because that's the length of the array. And before it got to that point, it would have gone through and added up each of these numbers, keeping a total. So again, next i would have kept looping around until it reached 10. It would have stopped. And then at the end, it would have created an average variable and assigned the total divided by the count, okay, which is simply the average. So it would have been all these numbers added up, divided by 10, and that would have stored the average in here. So again, this method is really useful if we don't know how many items we have, especially in a list, we can use the length function here, which is very, very important. And this loop will run until we reach the end of the list. And we obviously kept a count of how many items were inside. So we were able to work out the average. The next technique we have is to find the minimum value inside of an array. So again, an array, a list of items, 
we're going to use the same array, which is student marks, and we're going to use the same technique as a for loop to run from 1 to the end of the array. So we use this function length again, and we're going to run until the end of the array. Now, what's important when we're finding the minimum value is that we create a variable at the very beginning of the algorithm, and this is set to the highest possible value in our list. So because our list in this example is percentages, we know that percentages aren't going to be over 100. So the biggest possible value we've got is 100. Now, although it sounds confusing that the minimum mark is set to 100 at the beginning, the reason being is that once we get inside our loop here, we're checking if the marks are less than the minimum mark. So the minimum mark is 100 the first time this loops around. If the student's grade is lower than this, then it's stored in the minimum mark variable. So the 100 has gotten rid of and the new minimum mark is now saved. So the lowest number in each loop is saved each time. Okay, so if I just draw another example of an array. So again, we'll use 10 student marks just to keep it simple. One, two, three. I'm just putting some sample data inside. And if we run through the algorithm, and I'll keep a note of what's going on at each point. So the minimum mark is set to 100 at the very beginning, and then we're going to run from 1 to length of student mark. So this is essentially 1 to 10. Okay. This time I've changed the name of i to counter, just because it doesn't really matter what you put here. As long as you refer to the same word here, then that's how you should write a for loop. So whether you put i or counter or a word that describes what you're counting, then that's fine. But as long as they match up from here to here, then that's completely fine. Once we're inside the loop, we check if the student marks counter. So counter is currently 1, and the student mark is currently 90. We check if that's less than the minimum mark, which is currently 100. And then if it is, we set the minimum mark to the student marks counter, which, as we've just said, is 90. So is 90 less than 100? Yes, it is. So minimum mark now becomes 90. It's stored the lower value. It loops around using the same technique as before. It goes to this one, next counter, checks if 80 is less than minimum mark, which is now 90, which it is. So it puts the 80 inside the minimum mark and saves this instead. It loops around, next counter, goes up to 3, checks if 90 is smaller than 80, which it isn't. So in this case, this line is skipped because this condition wasn't true, and it simply goes around to the next counter. It will loop around going through each number, and only when the number is lower than the previous saved value will it store this number. So obviously 40 is the lowest number in this list, and 40 would have been saved on the ninth loop, and then the loop would have ended. So although it sounds strange that we set the initial value to the highest possible number, just as an example, if we set it to the lowest possible number, if we set this to zero here for the minimum mark, every time we loop round, the smaller number would never be saved because there are no numbers that will ever be less than zero in this example. So that's why we need to set it to the highest possible value so that we store the lowest number in each loop. When it comes to finding the maximum possible value, it's really just the same, but instead of storing the highest possible value at the beginning, we store the lowest possible instead. So in this example, we set the maximum mark to zero because obviously when we go through the loop, and we check if the number is bigger than the stored variable for maximum mark, it needs to save the bigger number. So this is changed also because we're checking if it's bigger than or more than. And if it is more than, then we save it again in the variable maximum mark. So this algorithm is exactly the same, except we change the number at the beginning and we swap this less than sign around to more than. So hopefully that makes sense, but they are identical except for those two changes there. And as always, guys, just to finish off, a couple of questions just to practice what we've learned. And in the first question, what we're going to do is write pseudocode to input five prices and calculate the total amount. So pause the video if you'd like to give it a go, and then I will run through the solutions. So if we remember how to keep a total, the first thing we need to do is create a variable called total, and we set this to zero. So this is the first thing that we do when we're keeping a total. Then we're going to loop, and because we know how many times we're going to loop, Hopefully you've realized that we need to use a count controlled loop, which is a for loop. And we're just going to run for i from 1 to 5. So it's going to loop five times using a count controlled loop. In other words, a for loop. We're going to ask the user to type in a number. So output, please enter a number. And in this case, it's a price. So we'll tell them to enter a price. Then we need to create the variable for this. So input, and we'll call it price. So the name of our variable is going to be called price. And then we add this value to the total and store it 
in our current total variable. Okay, this part is really important that we do total plus price, that's with a capital P, please excuse me, and it stores this value in our previous total variable. Then we get to the end of the loop and we say next i. So nice and simple, it loops around five times, taking in five numbers and keeps a total of this amount. Then what I'd like you to do is write pseudocode to input 10 numbers and count how many are greater than 50. So a couple of things here, we know it's gonna be a count controlled loop because it's a known amount of numbers, which is 10. So we can use the same technique as a for loop. And then we're going to count how many numbers are greater than 50. So because this time we're keeping a count of something, we need to create a variable for this and we're gonna call it count. So we're not keeping a total, we're keeping a count. And obviously at the beginning, we set this to zero and we use the same technique for i, and then this time it's one to 10. We tell the user to enter a number, just zoom in. So output, please enter a number. We input the number and store it in a variable. So we'll just call it num. Then we check if num is more than 50, then count becomes count plus one. So only if the number is more than 50, do we add one to the count. If it's not more than 50, then we skip past this line and we don't add one to the count. And the if next i, and this will loop 10 times until 10 numbers are input, checking if they are more than 50 in each loop. Then what we can do at the end is output if we wanted to and just say there are this many numbers more than 50. And we use our count variable to put it in a sentence and we say there are X amount of numbers more than 50. So if there are seven numbers that were bigger than 50, there are seven numbers more than 50. And then to finish off, it's getting a bit trickier, write through the code to input six temperatures and output the average temperature. So we need to use the average method of solution. We know how many temperatures there's gonna be. So again, we can use a for loop. And when we're working out the average, remember the average is the total divided by the count. But in this case, we don't need to keep a count because we know how many temperatures there are going to be. So the total at the end will simply be divided by six. So again, we need to keep a total variable so we keep a total variable, set it to zero. And just like before, four, I, one, two, six, because it's gonna loop six times. Tell the user to enter a temperature. We create a variable that they can input to. So input temp, then we keep a total. So total becomes total plus temp, so that we are storing the number in our total. Next I, this will loop six times. Once the loop has finally finished, we can create a variable called average and we can assign to this average variable, the total divided by six. And it's as simple as that. At the end, we can output the average. So output the average temperature is simply write the name of the variable. Okay, so it's as easy as that guys. If we didn't know how many there were, then we'd create a count variable, set this to zero. And then every time we looped through, we add one to count, simple as that. Okay, so if we didn't know how many it would be, it would be this, and we would have to change our loop to possibly the length of an array, for example, so length of a temperatures array. Or if it wasn't array, then we'd have to use a different type of loop, but we won't go into that now. Okay, so as always, guys, I hope you've managed to follow along and understand some of these core principles. As I've said, these standard methods of solution will come up definitely in paper two, so it's a good job that we simply understand and revise these techniques because once you understand and are able to follow the patterns, it does become really simple. And we're going to be picking up those marks in paper two, just in case you do struggle with programming. There are two more to discuss, which will follow in the next video. So stick around for that. And if you've got any questions, throw them in the comments and I'll be happy to clear them up. Okay, guys, so thanks for watching and see you next time.